We were camping upstate New York at a NY's campground. 40 other campsites and it was at capacity. 10 p.m. is quiet time and enforced. It's around 1 a.m. and everyone is asleep. I'm dreaming and in my dream hear a young girl yell out, help me, from pretty far away. In my sleep, I'm thinking, wow, that's weird and realistic and I hear it again and I wake up this time. I check on my kids, okay, they are still there. It's pitch black outside and every time I heard it, I was asleep, so maybe I was dreaming it. Then I heard it for the third time, help me, being not yelled but loud with a definite sense of fear and urgency to it, and she's deep in the woods away from the campsite. This time it sounded further away than the last. I'm now trying to figure out what to do. Is somebody dragging her to her death? Is an animal attacking her? The middle of the night and it's pitch black outside of the tent. I arm myself with my pocket knife locked open and I leave the safety of my tent ready to attack wondering what the news articles will say about my heroism and subsequent death from a murderer or wild animal. At this time there are other campers yelling out, where are you? Follow with only a response from her, help me, which is getting further and further away. I'm kind of freaked out at this point. So maybe four minutes have passed and other people have joined in the search. We hear somebody say we found her. I walk around to one of the, that site with people that were searching for her, and they said they found her. She was sleepwalking and walked into the woods. Apparently she does this a lot. Going back to sleep was challenging. We were hiking on a trail in Hawaii, and it was getting late. Few people were on the trail, but they were rare. My dad and I were walking up the trail, and we then get a call from my stepmother saying that she had heard some animal grunting in the bushes as she was nearing the end of the trail. She had finished the trail before we did. She thought it sounded like a pig. Wild boars can do some damage, and I knew they killed humans sometimes. So my dad and I each grab a branch and stone just in case. We didn't want to hurt it, but it would likely feel threatened if it saw us near its young and strike if deemed necessary. We walked up through the vegetation a lot of branches on this trail in complete silence to try to listen for this animal. I eventually spot it like seven feet to my left. It was big, had short black hair or fur, and didn't look like it had spotted us. I told my dad to keep moving because we were within earshot, and I noticed it was distracted, likely caring for its young. We hurriedly walked further up and eventually exited the trail. I saw another hiker about to enter, I genuinely don't know why. It was so late and I handed him my branch. Who knows, he may need it. I have a large farm in Gippsland, Australia. Most nights I would walk the fences with the dogs just to relax. This walk would usually take an hour and a bit. This one year in winter, we had a very large collection of dead trees in the back paddock that we had decided to burn, started the fire in the morning and let it burn all day. Every so often I'd go and check that it was okay. So I get to night and around 9 p.m. I decide to go for my walk and check on the fire go to get the dogs and they just stayed in their kennels. Which was strange, but they had a big day hurting. As I get down towards the fire I just get this chill through my body and start to feel unsettled. At this point I just beeline to the fire. As I'm about 5 meters from the fire I see a figure to my left, but behind me by about 50 feet. At this point I think it's one of the dogs that has finally followed me. I turn to call it over and I get no response, I whistle some commands and still no response, it's just standing there. I'm shitting bricks at this point and move closer to the fire and grab a burning branch. I start to think, I'm done, it's a wild dog, my wife will find me mauled, I decide to rush it and hopefully scare it off. I take two steps and this thing takes off like a bullet. The only noise is when it jumps the fence and hit the bush. I run back to the house to find the dogs all where I left them. The next day I go to check the fire with the dogs. Both of them refused to get out of the ute, and even the cows wouldn't go near the area. I stopped walking after that, and now I carry a knife with me when I go in that area of the farm.
Hiking the PCT always brings a new challenge, whether it be realizing that you actually wear size 11 boot when you've worn 10 for the last three years. It's quite wild how the smallest thing can become the biggest pain in your ass. Anyway, the biggest fright I had at night was realizing another hiker was following me. You think maybe he was just matching speed, but when you realize it's been three days and he said nothing is very sus. Most people are very welcoming and will set camp, but he was always there. It escalated to the point when one night I just had the most overwhelming sense of someone watching me and upon exiting my tent, I see a figure maybe 15 feet from me looking right at me. I was so shocked that I just froze and the man took off running. Needless to say, I slept with my pocket knife on me that night lol and just hightailed it the f out of there. I actually beat my best one day and marked 20 miles before I hit Stevens Pass. I was in Syria on a visit from Australia back in the late 90s. I saw two dogs in the distance about 30 meters away, lit up by a bright moon, they had faces that looked human. I seriously froze. They walked up to about 10 meters away and looked totally flipping human. One of them growled so I fired off a round and they ran away. I immediately headed back home looking over my shoulder the whole way. I told my aunt what I saw and the house erupted in laughter. It was some local ghost story. Everyone had an encounter with them at one stage or something. F those dogs. A mysterious hermit, with long a flowing beard and a chilling cackle, led two Boy Scout leaders Saturday midnight to the body of a murdered man in a Delaware County, Pennsylvania, woods. Then, as he showed them the remains, the hermit disappeared. An all-night and all-day search of the vicinity has failed to locate him. The murdered man has not been identified. The scout leaders were Wilmer Brown, 31, scoutmaster of the Colwyn Troop, and Walter Hawks, his assistant. They were on their way to the scout camp on Darby Creek, Delaware Township. When the two were at the edge of the woods, the hermit appeared. Flashlights of the scouts picked out his weird countenance from among the heavy brush and trees. Do you want to see something? The hermit asked in his strange, cackling way. Yes, the two replied, although later admitting they were frightened for the moment. Then the hermit led them through thicket and underbrush, over little used by paths, and through parts of the woods where no paths at all appeared. He came to a little clearing. Bending over, he parted the underbrush and said one word, look. Brown and Hawks complied. They saw with startled eyes the form of a man. A gun lay close at hand. They advanced into the thicket to get a closer view. Then turning to question the hermit, they discovered he had silently vanished. The scouts ran to the Springfield Township Police Headquarters. Sergeant Chandler was on duty. He called Coroner J. Evan Sheehill of Delaware County and a searching party set out. It took them nearly two hours to again reach the spot where the body of the man lay. At first, it was believed he was a self-harm, but no bullet holes were found in his tattered clothing or his decomposed body. The body was taken to the county morgue and an autopsy was performed. Then it was disclosed that the man had been beaten to death. Two shots had been fired from the gun near at hand but neither entered the body of the man. His clothing, though worn and tattered by exposure, told police the man had been well-to-do. Expensive dental work furnished a clue. Police are checking with all dentists in the Philadelphia area in hopes of identifying the man. Meanwhile, the hunt for the mysterious hermit with the white, flowing whiskers continues. At the time of the incident, I lived in south-central Pennsylvania near Chambersburg. The date was June 16, 2018. I was with my dog in the front yard. It was late night and I let the dog out before going to bed. Suddenly, I was hit by a bright, blinding light from above. It felt like it went down in me, then back up. It lifted my upper body up just a little bit. I felt like my arms and chest expanded with pure intense energy and light. 
When I looked down, my body was covered in shimmering light. The grass, the leaves, my arms. When I looked around, my movement felt like it was flowing. It stopped after about 10 seconds. Then for about 20 minutes after, I would get a small glimpse of that feeling, and I would get goosebumps up and down my arms and a warm feeling across my chest. The next morning I noticed a rash starting on my chest and arms. It spread very fast. Across my chest, down my shoulders, arms and tops of my hands. Everywhere that was exposed the night before. It continuously got worse. It was very painful and burned off and on. It was scaly as well. I soon called a dermatologist and was able to book an emergency appointment for two days later. It bothered me so bad, I almost went to the emergency room. The doctor had no idea what it was. It wasn't psoriasis or dermatitis. They tested for skin cancer, which was negative. They gave me a steroid cream and pills, but it didn't work at all. Nothing helped my condition. It was very itchy, it ached, and was bright red. If the sun got on it, the sores would swell and itch. I was also hearing strange sounds in my left ear. I heard humming, ringing, beeping tones, and a few times I heard people talking in an unrecognizable language. Then, one night, about two weeks later, I went to sleep and had terrible nightmares. I woke several times feeling nauseous. In the morning when I woke, I got out of bed to go to the bathroom. I looked in the mirror and the rash was completely gone. There was not a trace of the marks and there was no scarring. Five years since the recovery I feel better than ever. I used to suffer from Crohn's disease and arthritis, but both have dissipated completely. The doctors tell me that I have no trace of either malady. Is there a possibility that I was healed by that unknown light? In the sprawling city of Dallas, Texas, Detective John Matthews had seen it all. His years on the force had taught him to handle the darkest corners of human nature with a sense of resolve and calm. But one day, while rummaging through the dusty archives of his precinct, he stumbled upon a box of old, unsolved case files that piqued his interest. John was a man of methodical thinking, and the mysteries contained within those files intrigued him. Each case was tied to a horrific and unsolvable crime, with a common thread of unknown predators lurking in the shadows. Yet, there was one case that left him particularly shaken. As he read through the file, he found himself transported to a chilling narrative. The case revolved around a young police officer named Mark Williams, who had been sent to investigate a gruesome crime in a national park. The details were disturbing. It was as if a savage beast had torn through them. But what caught John's attention was not the brutality of the crime itself, but the young officer's detailed description of an otherworldly creature. According to the file, Officer Williams and his partner had stumbled upon a scene of horror deep within the snowy expanse of the National Park. The body of one of the campers lay torn and lifeless, and the surroundings were marked with signs of a violent struggle. But it was the creature Williams had described that sent shivers down John's spine. The creature was tall, completely black, and stood on two legs. Its arms hung down by its sides, dragging through the snow as it walked away from them. The most unsettling aspect was its face, or rather the lack of one. The creature had no discernible facial features. No eyes, no nose, no mouth. Just plain flesh stretched across its head. Officer Williams had written in the file that he believed the creature was responsible for the camper's death. He described the encounter with a mixture of fear and disbelief, struggling to find words to describe the incomprehensible creature he had witnessed. As John read those words, he couldn't shake the feeling that this case was different from the rest. There was a haunting authenticity in Officer Williams' account, something that made the hair on John's arms stand on end. The veteran detective found himself pulled into the mystery, unable to let go of the image of that faceless creature walking away into the snowy wilderness. Days turned into weeks as John delved deeper into the case. He combed through the evidence, the photographs, and the witness statements. He reached out to Officer Williams, who had long retired from the force and managed to arrange a meeting. 
Sitting across from each other in a dimly lit coffee shop, Officer Williams recounted the story once more. His eyes held a mixture of lingering fear and resignation. He told John how the encounter had changed him, how it had shattered his understanding of the world. As John left the coffee shop, he knew that he had to find answers. He couldn't let this case remain unsolved, couldn't let the memory of that creature fade into obscurity. With each passing day, his determination grew stronger. He re-examined every detail, retraced Officer William's steps, and consulted experts in fields ranging from cryptozoology to mythology. He uncovered legends of similar creatures in various cultures, creatures that existed on the fringes of human belief. But despite his efforts, John found himself at an impasse. The case remained open, its mysteries unsolved, and the faceless creature's existence unproven. Yet deep down, he knew that some truths were too unsettling to be accepted by the world at large. The first incident took place nearly 25 years ago now. I was stationed at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, went camping with a friend of mine in the southern part of the Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge. This is an isolated area where you can only gain access by boat or four-wheel drive vehicle. We arrived at our destination around 8 p.m. on a Saturday evening. After setting up camp, we decided to do some fishing before it got dark. It would take about 15 minutes to get open water by boat, so we left the campsite with four or five other guys who were also spending the night there. One member of our party noticed some tracks on the eastern shore of the river. We quickly got our flashlights and were amazed to see 15-inch long humanoid-like tracks in the sand. These tracks were only about two feet apart and ran straight down to the water's edge. The ground was soft and sandy so we could very easily make out the shape of these prints. We didn't miss seeing the claw marks or other strange markings that would be associated with the hoax. I myself measured one track at around 17 inches long and 7 inches wide. The depth of these tracks indicated that something very heavy made them and did not notice this approach. There is no way that these were made by a bear. They were too narrow for the front paws and the space between each step was far too large. Our other companions who were all military policemen did not want to stay around very long, so we decided to follow the tracks upstream against our gut instinct. After about 30 minutes, all of our flashlights died in unison, as if some electrical outage happened. We had replaced all the batteries prior to this trip, so we couldn't figure out why this happened. But it became very dark very quickly, and we began hearing strange sounds in the distance kind of like heavy breathing. This went on for hours, and since nobody wanted to spend any more time there than necessary, we returned back to camp. I've always wondered what made those footprints. I believe this area is heavily populated with Sasquatches, and soon after this incident, I read an article about an upcoming Sasquatch hunt in this very area. One of the hunters who was interviewed claimed that he had seen 15-inch tracks about one month earlier on the Alligator River. Several other sources also mentioned seeing these huge footprints around the Fort Bragg area. Now the second incident took place almost three years after while attending college at Norfolk State University. My girlfriend and I at the time were working part-time for a private security firm. We had to monitor some abandoned buildings that were having issues with break-ins. The first few nights were pretty well, but by Saturday night things had got really bad. We both kept hearing these loud screams all night beyond in the woods, sounding like someone mixed a lion, a goat, and a wolf all in one like a hybrid of some sort. It terrified us worse, it seemed to be coming from all directions. There was no way to track the sound, it would seem like it was coming from the north, then all of a sudden the southeast. This went on for roughly three hours. We could hear there were multiples of them, whatever they were but they weren't any normal animals I'd ever heard of my life. We've known other military servicemen who've also had some pretty bone-chilling experiences with these creatures in the area. It seems like this is a common occurrence here in the South. I know for a fact that something is awry out here in these woods. Sometimes even my own rifle don't make me feel safe.
I'm a seasonal hunter, but for years I dedicated my life to the study of predators and their intricate relationships with their ecosystems. My days were filled with observations, data collection, and a burning curiosity that drove me to understand the delicate balance of nature. One sunny morning, as the forest awakened around me, I found myself deep within the woods. The rustling leaves and distant calls of birds were familiar companions, but this day held something entirely new. As I quietly maneuvered through the undergrowth, my heart raced with anticipation. It was in these moments that the forest revealed its secrets to me, and then I saw it an enigmatic figure crouching amidst the shadows. The creature defied comprehension, its form a grotesque blend of humanity and death. Long, emaciated arms hung limply against its bony frame, its chest protruding with an eeriness that hinted at the presence of death itself. Its skin, a sickly shade of white with undertones of gray, bore an uncanny resemblance to the pallor of malnutrition. The most unsettling aspect was its head a human head, but distorted by starvation and agony. It was as if a dying human had been fused with the essence of the forest, becoming something entirely otherworldly. Yet what I mistook for white fur initially was nothing more than the creature's own skin stretched tautly over its bony features. Its eyes, though, held me in their eerie gaze. They were disproportionately small compared to its head, yet they shone with an intensity that was impossible to ignore. The light of the sun seemed to be captured within those eyes, reflecting back at me like beacons of otherworldly luminescence. In that moment, I felt a chill run down my spine, as if I were staring into the depths of some ancient, forbidden knowledge. As a scientist, my instinct was to remain hidden and observe, to document this encounter as I had countless others. My heart pounded in my chest as I positioned myself behind a tree, my pulse in sync with the rhythm of the forest. The creature moved with an eerie grace, its movements almost unnatural in their fluidity. For a while, it roamed the clearing, its presence commanding a silence that was both awe-inspiring and terrifying. And then, without warning, it emitted a screech that pierced the air like a banshee's wail. My breath caught in my throat as the creature vanished into the depths of the woods, leaving behind an aura of mystery that clung to the air. I remained hidden for a long while, grappling with what I had just witnessed. My mind raced, attempting to categorize this creature within the confines of my knowledge. But there was nothing, no data, no precedent, no explanation that could account for its existence. As I returned to civilization and shared my encounter with others, I was met with skepticism and disbelief. How could I, a scientist, expect anyone to accept such a fantastical tale? But I stood my ground, asserting that the unknown remains a part of our world, waiting to be discovered. This is a true story, one that has challenged my understanding of nature and the boundaries of scientific knowledge. I am a wildlife biologist, a seeker of truth in the wild, and I can attest that even in our modern age, mysteries remain hidden in the heart of the untamed world. Okay, so I know what you are thinking, and I am actually not a true believer of Bigfoot or whatever this was. But this man claims that what he saw was true, and he will never be able to get what happened out of his mind. Here is what he told me. So he was an older fellow who loved spending his time in rural Alaska. I'm not talking a couple hundred people, but completely by himself in his cabin in the woods. So during the winter, he was out by himself as usual about 10 miles from the nearest village, and he had just got done with his chores and whatnot. He was settling down and had just stoked the fire for the night. So he decided to go to bed, so he did. About 1 or 2 a.m., he suddenly woke up and got the feeling like he was being watched by something. He was pretty shook up by it and eventually got back to sleep. This is where it got kind of weird. When he woke up the next morning, he looked out his two-story window, remember cabin's floors may be shorter than normal buildings, and to his surprise, there were frozen marks on the window of what looked to be the hands and a nose pressed on the window, as if someone was cupping their hands around their eyes trying to look into the window. This obviously could not have been a person as he was alone, and it was more than one story off the ground. 
He was pretty freaked out by it and went outside to look for some tracks or anything, but he found nothing in them. No tracks and no trails leading anywhere into the woods. This man was not crazy or a drunk. He was well known in the village and he was a really nice guy. The story is a little hard to believe, but it is what he said happened. It gives me the creeps just thinking about being alone in the middle of nowhere and having something try look in my window at me in the middle of the night. What I am about to tell all of you is very real. It happened in the fall of 23 and has left a mark on me ever since. It was a Friday, and the only reason I remember it was a Friday is because I used to have friends over during that particular time on Friday evenings. We used to play video games and other things normal typical teenage boys used to do, but that's neither here nor there. My friends and I were immensely interested in the paranormal, and during times of boredom or times of spontaneous adventure, we liked to wander around the woods behind my mom's house, which is still standing to this very day. These woods were typical woods, dark, forbidden, and creepy at night. Nothing was ever expected to be seen or heard in these woods. We just liked to scare ourselves. It was fun. Fun until after exiting the woods on that particular Friday night in the fall of 2003. As we were walking away from the woods, we saw a dark figure walking in the darkness of a shadow casted by a telephone pole. Not until the figure moved out of the shadow did we see that it wasn't just a random man walking around at midnight on a Friday night. It was something else. This creature was walking as fast as any human could run. Its giant step span was a dead giveaway. This was not a human. Once we noticed that it was something other than a fellow man or any animal that we've ever seen, we sprinted all the way back to my mom's house. That was the first and last time I ever seen this creature, but it was not my last encounter with it. That is for another time though. Thank you and good night. Part two. My second encounter with Bigfoot was hard to tell. This time around it was 2006, and this time around it was in the pitch blackness of the woods. Three of us daringly set out to experience the presence of Bigfoot once again. This was not our first time back in the woods since the first meeting, nor was it the first time looking for the creature again. Our group started out as five, but as soon as we hit the woods, two cowardly bowed out. We entered the woods with a flashlight and nothing more. It was the middle of the summer and very dark inside the woods due to the thickness of the brush. Walking rather cautiously for about 20 minutes, we reached deeper and deeper into the woods. Once we came upon a small stream within the woods, we heard something else among us. A loud crash sounded directly in front of us. Terrified that we had been spotted by whatever was with us in the woods, we all immediately whispered to turn the flashlight off. Standing there in the dark, we heard the noise again. A very loud crash. The sound of something metal hitting something else metal. A very odd sound for it being heard in the middle of the woods. After about a minute of these loud crashes, the worst thing happened. It got quiet. It was so horrifying standing there in the middle of the woods in the dark, silent, standing so very close to this beast. The dead giveaway that it wasn't a human was the piercing low growl it emitted after another minute of silence. We could feel the breath of this creature as it snarled at us. We were that close. To say that we ran would be an understatement. Totally disregarding the trail, we all split up escaping to the outside. Once we were out of the woods, we did not look back. We continued to run all the way home. This was my last encounter with the fiend, whatever it may have been. For the sake of classification, it matched very well with other Bigfoot descriptions, so I decided to call it Bigfoot. As I've said before, the beast and the first encounter could have been entirely different, but the events were so similar. In my mind, it was the same. I have been back to those woods many, many times after this encounter, and still have yet to experience anything else. Occasionally we hear noises, but nothing significant enough to call an encounter. Thank you and good night.
The roar of my diesel engine echoed through the night as I barreled down the asphalt, my eyes fixated on the desolate ribbon of road ahead. I was Jack, a seasoned trucker who had seen his fair share of highways, but there was one stretch that had always seemed like a tale spun to spook the newcomers the infamous Highway of Shadows. I'd heard stories of ghostly apparitions, unexplainable vanishings, and sinister whispers that haunted anyone foolish enough to traverse its path. But until that night, I had remained a skeptic, shrugging off the tales as nothing more than trucker folklore. My rig rumbled along, tires humming beneath me, as the radio played a medley of classic rock hits. I chuckled to myself, shaking my head at the thought of such superstitions. But then the radio crackled, the music giving way to an unsettling chorus of whispers and distorted voices that chilled my spine. I frowned and fiddled with the dial, trying to restore the normal broadcast. The voices seemed to murmur words I couldn't quite decipher, a sinister undercurrent that sent shivers down my arms. As if the radio weren't enough, my headlights began to flicker, casting fleeting shadows that danced along the edges of the road. My grip on the wheel tightened, and I forced myself to take a deep breath, attributing the odd occurrences to fatigue and a vivid imagination. That's when I saw the dark, imposing figure standing dead center in my lane. My foot instinctively moved to the brake pedal, but I hesitated, squinting through the windshield at the impossible sight. The creature before me was unlike anything I'd ever encountered. It stood tall and massive, its body covered in coarse, matted fur that seemed to ripple with every gust of wind. This wasn't just any creature. It was as though a powerlifting Bigfoot had emerged from the depths of my worst nightmares. Towering at a staggering twelve feet, its shoulders were hunched with muscle, and its limbs were thick and gnarled like ancient tree trunks. I felt a tremor of fear ripple through my body as I stared at the creature's otherworldly form. My heart raced, and I slammed my foot on the brake pedal, bringing my rig to a screeching halt just a few yards away from the monstrous being. The creature turned its head toward me, and that's when I saw them its eyes. They glowed a hellish shade of red, like burning coals in the dead of night. My breath caught in my throat as I realized I was face to face with something not of this world. Before I could fully process what was happening, the creature let out a roar that shook the very ground beneath me, a sound that seemed to vibrate in my bones. It was a roar that rivaled the thunder of an approaching storm, and in that moment I felt a primal fear like I'd never known before. The creature's mouth opened wide, revealing a set of wolf-like fangs that gleamed in the moonlight, dripping with some sort of viscous fluid. Instinct and terror kicked in simultaneously. I slammed my hand onto the horn, unleashing a cacophony of blaring sound as I desperately hoped to startle the creature away. It turned its gaze toward me, those red eyes boring into my soul, and then it moved a sudden, explosive burst of motion that defied its immense size. It lunged toward my truck, its massive arms outstretched, and I felt the vehicle shudder as its fingers scraped against the metal. Adrenaline surged through my veins as I fumbled for the ignition, the engine roaring to life. I stomped on the accelerator, tires spinning on the asphalt as I aimed to drive over the creature. But it was too quick, too massive, and my truck's front end only narrowly missed it. The creature roared again, a deafening sound that reverberated in my eardrums, and I felt its hot breath against my window as it tried to reach inside. With a desperate surge of power, I managed to pull away, tires screeching as I left the creature in my dust. I peered into the rearview mirror, heart pounding as I watched the massive form grow smaller and smaller until it vanished into the darkness. The road ahead stretched on, empty and eerie, and my hands trembled on the wheel. What had I just encountered? My skepticism had been shattered in an instant, replaced by a chilling awareness of the supernatural. The radio was silent now, the whispers gone, but the echoes of that monstrous roar still echoed in my mind. I knew one thing for certain whatever that creature was, it was not bound by the laws of our reality. I always loved RV camping with my family. It was a tradition that we started when I was a kid, and we continued it every summer. We had an old RV that we used to travel around the country, 
exploring new places and enjoying nature. It was our home away from home, and we had many happy memories in it. This year, we decided to go to a secluded campground in the mountains, where we could relax and disconnect from the world. It was me, my wife, and our two kids, a boy and a girl, aged 10 and 8. We packed our bags, loaded the RV, and hit the road. The drive was long, but scenic. We passed by green fields, rolling hills, and sparkling lakes. We sang songs, played games, and told stories. We were having a great time until we reached the last stretch of the road. It was a narrow, winding path that led us deeper into the woods. The trees were tall and dense, blocking the sunlight and the view. The road was bumpy and uneven, making the RV shake and rattle. We felt like we were entering a different world, a darker and more mysterious one. We finally arrived at the campground, which was nothing more than a clearing in the forest, with a few wooden signs and a fire pit. There was no one else there, which we thought was strange, since it was peak season. We shrugged it off, thinking that maybe we were lucky to have the place to ourselves. We parked the RV, hooked it up to the power and water supply, and set up our camp. We pitched a tent, unfolded some chairs, and lit a fire. We roasted marshmallows, sang songs, and told stories. We were having a great time until the sun went down. That's when we started to hear them. At first, they were faint and distant, like whispers in the wind. We couldn't make out what they were saying, but they sounded like human voices. We thought they were other campers, maybe in another clearing nearby. We ignored them, thinking that they would quiet down soon. But they didn't. They got louder and closer, like they were coming towards us. We could hear them more clearly, and we realized that they were not speaking any language we recognized. They were chanting in a rhythmic and sinister way. They sounded like they were in a trance or a frenzy. We got scared, and we decided to go inside the RV. We locked the doors, closed the windows, and turned on the lights. We hoped that they would leave us alone, or that they would pass by us. We hoped that they were harmless, or that they were just playing a prank. But they weren't. They surrounded us. We could see them through the curtains, moving in the shadows. They were wearing dark robes, hoods, and masks. They carried torches, knives, and symbols. They looked like a cult or a sect. They looked like they were up to no good. They circled the RV, chanting louder and louder. They banged on the walls, scratched the windows, and rocked the vehicle. They tried to break in to get to us. They wanted us for some reason. They wanted to hurt us, or worse. We panicked, but we decided to stay silent. After about an hour, they went silent. I slowly opened door and no one is outside. I turned my head towards my family and asked them, WTF just happened? I am in summer camp and something is throwing people off trees. A little introduction before we begin. My friends and I have been going to summer camp every year. Tom, Jack, Susan, and Emily are my friends who have been accompanying me since forever. We are high school students. This time we chose a different camp. It was called Camp Jacob, and it's on a small island called Jacob's Isle. We traveled to Jacob's Isle on a ferry. It is about three and a half hour journey from the mainland, and the first thing we noticed was that there is no cell reception here. David is the leader of the summer camp, and he has a satellite phone for communication with the ferry and mainland. We hiked till the camp. It was a half hour hike. We saw the establishment was amazing. There were two dozen small huts made of wood. The main building was no different. The main building was in the middle of the camp and it comprised of a common room, kitchen, dining room, a storage room, and an infirmary. Twelve huts each on either side of the main building. Each hut had two bunk beds and can fit four people. Tom, Jack, and I got in hut seven along with fellow camper Ashwin. Emily and Susan went to hut 21. All four corner huts, 1, 12, 13, 24, were occupied by them. We were to unpack and meet the others in 30 minutes where we shall make a bonfire for the evening. It was a fun experience. We have made friends with Ashwin, 
and we also met the girls sharing the hut with Susan and Emily. They were Lily and Rose. Lily and Rose were cousins. We had dinner and were told that we would go to the sunrise point in the morning, and so we have to wake up by 4.30 a.m. as the sunrise is at 5.45 a.m. It is a half-hour hike, and it wasn't easy to get up so early. We started the hike at 5.15 a.m., and were told it was about 10 minutes away, but in reality it took twice the time. We were on the east coast of the island. It was a beach of white sand. This was my new favorite place Jack had his camera out to capture the moment when the sun rises. It was a beautiful sight and worth waking up early. We hiked back to the camp through the forest when we heard a growling sound. It was scary. The counselors huddled us and escorted us back to the camp. I could see that they were nervous. We were told to go to the main building for breakfast. I saw David and three others went scouting north of the camp. The other counselors were smiling, but they were tensed. What do you think that sound was? I asked. It was scary. I don't care what it was and I don't want to know. Susan replied, only that it should stay away from us. Emily said, come on, Peter, don't scare the girls. Tom laughed. Yeah, it can be a bird or something. The forest can make it sound scarier. Ashwin said with conviction, I disagree. Something scary is out there. Check this out. Jack gestured us to take a look at his camera. The small LCD screen wasn't so easy to look at, but Emily saw what Jack wanted to show. It took a lot of pointing and zooming before I could see the red dots behind the trees. Jack thought they were eyes. I thought they were lens flares or something. This is not a scary movie, all right. It must be some lens flare thingy. I said, but deep down I was scared too. Susan queried, guys, where is Lily and Rose? Must be somewhere here, Ashwin said. I haven't seen them after we came back to camp. Tom responded in a worried manner. Come, Susan, let's check the hut out. Emily grabbed on Susan's hand and they went to find Lily and Rose. No sooner did they leave the common room did we hear the same growling sound followed by loud shrieks. We ran outside to see Emily fainted and Susan holding her. Then I saw the lifeless body of Rose. Blood splattered everywhere, as if she has jumped from a tall building. Another bone-chilling growl and then I froze. I saw Lily flying. Something had thrown her from a tree and she came crashing down just beside Rose. I couldn't scream. This was something which I had never expected to witness. This couldn't be a dream as I don't have the imagination to imagine something as gruesome as this. The counselors came running out and asked us to check if anyone else is missing. It was a huge mess. Everyone was shouting. It took some time for us to settle down. We were scared to death. The bodies were moved to the infirmary in the main building. Everyone else was accounted for. David and the three others who left with him returned, and they called the mainland for the ferry. The camp was obviously cancelled. The growling continued. We were told to pack up our stuff and we would leave after three hours. It wasn't easy to wait for three long hours. We have to hike south to go to the dock. They should send the army to kill this thing. Emily said, still shaking. The growling continued. Maybe this thing has given birth or something and felt threatened when we came here. Susan said, stop trying to justify murder. I shouted, I know she was just trying to help, trying to make sense of it all, but I was scared shitless. I am sorry, I am just scared. I apologized. Susan put her hand on mine. It's okay, I understand. We were all called outside and David announced, Given the circumstances, we will not hike to the dock. We will wait here for help to arrive. The sheriff's department along with the forest rangers will be arriving soon, and they will escort us out of here. Till then, stay here and stay quiet. Please don't wander off anywhere. If you have to go back to the hut, then inform a counselor. Don't go out alone. This was good news. After a few tense hours, we were escorted out to the ferry and returned home. On the way back, we were told it was a bear which must have done it. But it was a bizarre scenario. 
No one has ever heard anything like this before. I don't buy it one bit. Something is definitely wrong in that island. I have promised myself no more summer camps. But I still have nightmares and I feel that I am back at the camp. It is night time and something is throwing me down from the top of a tree. I had heard this story when I was back in college. I don't remember where it came from, but it's always stuck with me due to the horrific descriptions of what this park ranger saw. I'm not really sure about the names or dates for this one. However, I can tell you that it happened at least 15 years ago, possibly longer though. The older I get, the memory becomes less clear. A man, forgive me if his name escapes me, who had been a ranger for several years at this point, had talked about reporting seeing something absolutely bone-chilling while driving along late at night. It was dark outside, obviously, and there were no lights to illuminate the area in which he saw something he could not explain. He also mentioned not seeing proper moonlight, thus giving him little chance to see what it was he had witnessed. He, however, saw enough to be able to tell the others about what was out there in the darkness. It wasn't until recently that this man told anyone of his sighting. He did not want people to say he was crazy or even lying. But at some point following the incident, one of his fellow rangers told him that the other rangers had reported seeing something similar while working in nearby areas along the road. None of them knew what they were looking at, but they all agreed it could not have been an animal known to inhabit these regions. Bear, deer, etc. The descriptions given by each ranger even matched the description given by the first ranger. The only difference being which area they had seen the thing. What they claimed to have seen was a tall, dark figure that stood on two legs, having no discernible neck. The head sat directly upon the shoulders, no visible ears or hair above its brow, and a long arm hung down just below its knees while the other one reached to its upper chest, or so they describe. The main ranger said it looked like something out of a horror movie. It made him so scared that he nearly lost consciousness just from seeing it standing there, not 25 feet away from him. That's just how frightening the sighting was for him. It didn't appear to show any hostility towards him, which is why he kept his distance. But at the same time, its appearance was more than enough to paralyze the man with fear. He drove off as fast as he could without looking back. Keep in mind, this was no misidentification. This is a seasoned outdoorsman. He's been around mountain lions, bobcats, bears, and all other sorts of various wildlife. He knew what he was saying was certainly nothing that he had ever seen before. The ranger was aware that whatever this was had to be something otherworldly. What he saw made him so scared he never told another living soul about it until many years later. It's also worth mentioning that this ranger does not drink, do drugs, or suffer from any mental illness at all that I'm aware of. He is a very well-spoken individual who would not say anything unless he really believed what happened to him was really the way it happened, as he described. If one person witnessed such an encounter, surely there are others since these areas are also frequented by many people a day. I'm not certain if anybody else has seen something similar to what he is talking about, but if you do, please comment below on this post. I would love to know. Normally, I've never been a believer in or a psyche of any kind of cryptid or unknown creature. However, around 1986, I was stationed aboard the U.S. Tortuga Els T-1A-189 as a Navy Reserve Officer. We had spent the day off the coast of Haiti, making sure that relief supplies were delivered to the Haitian people who needed them very much after a hurricane had demolished their country. That night, our ship was underway on its way back to Jacksonville, Florida, where we were currently based. It was dusk, and the sky had gained considerable pinkish hues, and the sun was just starting to set in the sky. Myself and two other fellow lieutenants were standing on the open bridge wings of the ship, watching Haiti fade on the horizon. As we looked over the port side of the ship, one of us three said he saw a flying creature. It was dark so it really stood out against the pink sky. It was headed toward our ship, 
at least the direction from ahead of us into port. The first statement of any of us made was that it must be some kind of large bird. If you had seen the size of our propellers on the ship, you would know that a bird could get caught in it and be torn to pieces, assuming it was a large water bird that dove underneath the water. It kind of resembled a huge bat, though the closer it got long pointed ears and a long tail. We were trying to figure out what kind of bird this was when we lost sight of it behind the mast of the ship as it rounded the front of the bridge. We lost sight of it again. Then, as our eyes followed it beyond the bow, we saw that this creature was now flying alongside of us. Our claims at first were now countered by those around us, suggesting that perhaps it wasn't a bird. But now those gathered on deck were laughing and pointing at the creature as it flew along with us. One statement I remember was that it has got to be a bird. But this thing kept flying, and we can now see its bright red eyes glaring down onto the deck of our ship. As any of you who have ever seen a bat up close, their eyes shine with an amazing red light, which you can see coming out of them even in the darkness. Now, being at night with no real background reference to compare its sides with, we were all wondering what this could possibly be. We agreed that it wasn't a goose or a condor, but maybe a pelican, although I have never seen a pelican that resembled the bat we witnessed. It flying alongside of us for about five minutes. Then it began to glide away from the ship and across the horizon. The last we saw of it was a tiny dot on the horizon where its eyes had been glaring at us when it had glided over the water's surface. We never exactly figured out what it was, and none of us were ever believers in cryptids or strange creatures before this. I do feel that whatever we saw was some form of unknown species. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.